Hey, welcome everybody on Zoom and then you all here. So this is the first time we've tried to do a simultaneous Zoom and live, and we'll probably use this format in the future and even add uh, uh, Facebook to do our live things on Facebook. So, so we, uh, we're going to talk today about the use of meteorites on prehistoric people of Central Arizona and primarily concentrate on the ones we have in our current exhibit, which hopefully you've all had a chance to go out there and, and look at. Uh, okay, so um, what this is showing you is that meteorites have been found in many of the ancient uh, sites throughout uh, North America and into Central America. Um, the uh, yellow ones, I mean the red ones are the ones we're going to talk about just briefly, and the black ones are just other ones that are in the area. And you can see there's a a concentration in Arizona, New Mexico, uh, and uh, other places, but primarily here. And the reason, basically, is when a meteorite falls, uh, most of the country is in cornfields or forests or water, and so the people can't. It's hard to find them when they're in that kind of environment. With Arizona and New Mexico being pretty much flat and deserty, um, it's easier to find them in this area. So that's a good reason why you see so many here, and even down into Mexico. So I'll go through a few here uh, that we don't have on display, but just to kind of show you, I'm going to actually lead to a kind of a pattern. Uh, and so the Navajo meteorite was quote unquote found in 1921 in Apache County, uh, which had been buried by Navajo with rock debris at the base of a cliff. And there were actually two masses. You can see there's 3,300 pounds and another one 1,500. And you can see the, the split uh, between them on the right. And the case on the left is how it was displayed in the Smithsonian back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And it's, it's been taken off of display. And uh, what's interesting is, is that there are um, some what appear to be man-made markings. You can see a straight line down here, showing up there, yeah. And, and there's actually some over here. And I don't remember exactly where, but if we were to zoom in, there's like a person, like a round head with like rays coming out of it, like a sick figure. And so clearly this is this is pretty old. And the Navajo referred to these marks as being made by prehistoric pottery makers. And I use the term found in quotes because it, the Navajo had known about this since at least 1600s. And they covered it up and they recognized it as something special. And they didn't tell anybody about it until in the 1920s, a couple of Navajo got persuaded with a little bit of financial incentive to take investigators to the meteorite site. And once they found it, they packed it up and, and shipped it off to the Smithsonian, unfortunately. So that's how that ended up. Uh, Mesa Verde meteorite. Uh, many people have never heard of this. Um, it was found in 1922 by Jesse Walter Fuchs of the Smithsonian when he was studying the Sunshine House over at Mesa Verde National Park. And it's an irregularly shaped meteorite. It's pretty small, barely eight pounds. Um, and in his notes, he says it appeared that the position of the find indicated to him with a fairly strong degree of certainty that they were placed there during its construction in 1275. The interesting thing is, in this little altar setting, there were five stones, and this was one of the five, and he did not recognize it as a meteorite. But when he sent all five of them back to the Smithsonian and they examined them, this one turned out to be a meteorite, and that's how it got its name, the Mesa Verde meteorite. So whether, whether or not the, the inhabitants of Mesa Verde, uh, Sun Shrine House, actually recognize it as a meteorite or just as a really cool rock along with the other ones, uh, we certainly don't know. But it was in fact found at Mesa Verde. Uh, the Willamette meteorite, and I was instructed to not say Willamette, it's Willamette <laughs> by people of that uh, particular region. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It was discovered in, in, in 1902. It weighs 15 and a half tons. Uh, it's an iron meteorite, the largest ever found in the United States and the sixth largest in the world. Uh, it's 10 feet by six feet by two and a quarter feet. Uh, it's actually at the National uh, uh, American Museum in New York, uh, Natural History Museum in New York. And it's, it's known uh, as a sacred object by the Clackamas people who lived in the Willamette Valley before the arrival of the European settlers. And it is revered by them and their descendants. An interesting story is uh, the Ellis brothers uh, owned property right next to where this was found. This was actually on the property of an iron company. And uh, they were moving around, looking around, uh, uh, and uh, they came upon this meteorite. And they said, wow, this, this, we can make some money on this. 
So what they did is they basically uh, got a whole bunch of their friends and they dug it up, somehow lifted it up and put it onto a cart and then rolled the cart. They had cut through the forest and they rolled the cart over to his property. As soon as it got on his property, he put out word, hey, come and see the largest meteorite for a dollar. And he, for about a year, he was selling admissions to see the meteorite. Well, unfortunately, one of the people who came to see the meteorite was the attorney for the iron company. And he, all he had to do was look at the meteorite, turn around, and he could see this path cut through the forest where it came from. And you can see at the end of that where they dug this up. So he knew clearly it was on their property. So he sued them. And about a year or two later, they won, and he had to return it to the iron company. But the iron company, uh, it was a millionaire that heard about this, and he bought it and, and donated it to the uh, American History Museum in New York. So it's been there ever since. However, one of the deals, you can see how it's got a, a little uh, fence around it. The, uh, uh, as part of the National uh, uh, the Native American Grave Repatriation Act, the Clackamas went to the museum and said, this is a sacred object. We want you to return it to the Willamette Valley. And clearly, that was not something they were too pleased and interested in doing. So they negotiated and negotiated, and they came up with a deal that one, one day in each year, they closed this gallery, and only members of the Clackamas uh, tribe can go there, and they do whatever they do whether they do ceremonies, dances, we don't know, because uh, it's, it's private. And so that was the deal, that they would get one day a year to visit it in private, to do whatever they do. Uh, the, Brenham, the Brenham meteorite is kind of cool. Uh, you can see most of, when you see these names, meteorites are named after the closest geological feature. It could be a town, like in this case, Brenham, or the Willamette one was found in the Willamette Valley, and so it was named after that. Um, so in this case, they started to find these meteorite fragments back in, in 1949, and even a little bit, well, actually 1880s. And uh, every year they were finding ways. They would plow up their fields, they'd find more pieces. And so you can see uh, the larger pieces are mar marked on this. You can tell this was another one of those meteorites that entered the atmosphere, started to break up, and pieces were falling, and uh, people were collecting them along the way. So it's, as it says, 1949, they found one that was 990 pounds, and 2005, 1,400 pounds. 30 pounds, so this was a pretty big spread. Now, the interesting thing about this, now remember, this is Brenham, Kansas, okay? They have found Brenham, Kansas meteorites at, among the Hopewell culture in Illinois and Ohio. So clearly someone was picking those pieces up in Kansas, uh, recognized it as um, something from the heavens, and traded it, or maybe the Hopewell were out there doing something, and they brought it back to Illinois and Ohio. Uh, in this one particular place, they found two specimens, uh, among other uh, offerings on an altar. Uh, the Illinois Hopewell, they found 22 iron foil overlaid beads. So they basically took the iron, flattened it down into almost a foil, wrapped it around a wooden bead. And so they were able to do carbon dating because of the interior wood that was in it. And they came back as 386 BC and 250 BC. So uh, even though the, the uh, meteorite was way over there in Kansas, somehow made their way to Illinois. But um, as it says here, the Hopewell artisans used the iron and they crafted adzes, axes, awls, cells, chisels, drills. Uh, so what they think is that they weren't actually used as they, they were meant. But if you were like, if, if you're trade, you used a, an awl, you would get one out of, out of the meteorite, which would be a very sacred kind of thing to represent your, your craft. So, uh, so even the Hopewell <clears throat> back then were doing meteorite work. So this one starts to, we'll, we'll start to see a pattern here. The Casa Grandis or Paquemé meteorite, <clears throat> excuse me, Paquemé is actually a, a United Nations World Heritage Site. It's a huge ruin, uh, extraordinarily complex. Uh, a lot of archaeoastronomy uh, features in there. Uh, there's a planetarium and other things there. And, and they found this particular meteorite in, in a partially subterranean room. So you can see that it's 3,400 pounds. There was no way that they were going to lift it out of there. They saw it, maybe the top half of it, started digging around and saw how big it was. So they then built a room around it. It was below sub, sub, uh, the, the surface level, so subsurface room. And when they found it, it was wrapped in a linen cloth, a very coarse linen cloth that they referred to as mummy cloths. And in that same room were a variety of human remains wrapped in similar mummy cloths. And so the theory was that they recognized it as something from the heavens and they were 
ritualistically reburying it, symbolically reburying it. And because it was from the heavens, they probably had people of great stature uh, wrapped up in the mummy cloth and put in the same room with this meteorite. So it's a pattern you can start to see now. A little closer to home, and some of you might have heard of the Winona meteorite. Uh, this was found in 1928 uh, in a stone lined cyst, 18 by 10 inches below the ground, uh, near a small dwelling five miles northwest of Winona, which is about, oh, it's like two stops going east out of Flagstaff off I 40. Um, and it's not, however, a meteor, a meteor crater meteorite. Uh, people who found this basically they were they were grave hunters and they took these big long metal poles and they would go around the ruins and hoping to find an area that was soft so when they went into the earth the soft they thought aha we got a burial here and then they would look for the whatever was associated with it that's how we found this one they found this this uh, little cyst and uh and it's important to remember this is lined in, in kind of like a flagstone and then put inside and then they put a slab on top of it um, this, when they found this, they analyzed it back in 1928, 1929, uh, and 30. What they found was that they never found another meteorite up to that point that had exactly the same mineralogical content anywhere in the world. It was unique in the world. And so they named it uh, this type of meteorite. It's called a Winonite meteorite. Since then, they found about 28 more Winonite meteorites around the world, mostly in Antarctica. Uh, and they actually do two international uh, expeditions to Antarctica every year, international, because you think about it, you, got, you find them in the desert because it's flat, it's easy to see stuff on the surface. Antarctica is all white. And so if a big black stone falls on a white surface, you're going to see it miles away. Mm -hmm. And so they actually have these big expeditions twice a year to go collect meteorite fragments. And that's where they found most of the Winonites. And Winonite, they believe, is among the big bang pieces of uh, of ore. And so it's among the oldest uh, ever found anywhere in the world. And so how did this one fall over, over by, you know, Flagstaff? Of course, nobody knows. Did they, did they carry it there? Highly unlikely. Uh, they said in the report that when they originally found it, it was uh, egg-shaped, weighed about 53 pounds. But it had been out in the elements. So this was getting soaked with snow, uh, melt, and, and rain. And so it's iron. So it's going to start to deteriorate. So when they went to pick it up, it it grows broken into a whole bunch of pieces. So uh, that's why it looks like a, a little bunch of, bunch of little pieces there, but it was actually initially when they opened it up, it was one 53 pound egg shaped piece. So we had the Aquame where they did a ritualistic review barrel, and now we got Winonite way the heck up near Flagstaff. Again, what looks to be a ceremonial or symbolic reburial of the item. So it brings us to the Candy Diablo meteorite. Now, it's known as Meteor Crater, and but that you can see in the far distance here, my little finger will work here. Uh, where am I? Oh, here's, Can here's Candy Diablo. See this thing up here? So that's the closest geological feature to this particular crater. So that's how it got named uh, Candy Diablo meteorite. Uh, there's no water there. The, the canyon hardly ever has any water. Uh, but, uh, it's, it's pretty much out in the middle of nowhere. So this was a 60,000 ton uh, meteorite, fell about 50,000 years ago that created the crater. Uh, and it's one of the best preserved meteoritic impact craters in the world. Uh, the astronauts, when they were going to the moon, did their moon buggy training down within this crater. And they have all kinds of pictures to show you about that. Uh, and interestingly, uh, the fragments have been found, uh, the canyon, which you're gonna see and we're talking about now, the ones we have in the room here, these Canyon Diablo meteorite fragments have been found in or, in or near several ancient dwellings. Now, the first one we're going to talk about is the Camp Verde meteorite. And that's the big one over there. It's uh, found in 1927 by an amateur collector of Indian relics. That's how they called himself. Rather than calling himself a pot, a pot hunter, uh, he called himself an amateur collector of relics. Okay. And uh, he was just doing the same thing. He was running around with this big metal pole bouncing around the floors of the room, hoping to find some, a soft spot that might be a burial, that might have some jewelry in it or what have you. And when he, when he hit this particular spot in the room, you can see that on the arrow there showing the room in particular that it was in, there's a little plaza, you see, and that's the east side. So it's the only plaza on the east side where a sunrise occurs. And it was in a room just opposite 
right on the corner, you can see a little entrance to the, to the right. It was in that corner room, and it was buried in a stone-lined cyst, wrapped in a turkey feather blanket, with a slab put on top of it, very similar to Winona. Exact, almost exactly the same, except it had the feather, feather, uh, the turkey feather blanket wrapped around it. Um, we had a lot of trouble finding this location. Um, I don't know if I got it in the next slide or not. No. Um, we, there was a lot of rumors as to where it was because the description was nine miles east of the Camp Verde Post Office uh, in 1927. Well, what is nine miles east of? It could be anywhere. And we thought it was the Winona, uh, the uh, Ringshire Mesa. Me, uh, for a long time. But then we found a photograph of, of uh, Harvey Nininger, who uh, purchased this from the Indian relic hunter. Um, and he said, I'm not going to buy it unless you take me to where you found it. And so he took it, to, took him to this ruin. And he's, uh, we have a picture of him. It was at the Denver Museum of Natural History, standing in the hole where it was found. And by the, the topographical background from his picture, we identified exactly what ruin it was in. With the John Keith ruin that's down uh, High, uh, Forest Service Road 618, um, about two, three miles north of 260, off to the left. There's a series of ruins uh, in that area, both east and west of 260. So it was in, in that particular room. It's 135 pounds. Um, it's basically two feet by one foot, five inches, five and a half inches thick at the base. And then it tapers off as you probably saw it could have a point. And again, it confirmed that it was from Media Crater. Uh, it was from the Canyon Diablo meteorite that created a meteor crater that was 53 miles, air miles, or as the crow flies, uh, from meteor crater. So while I was uh, down there, some of you might remember about five, six years ago, we, we, uh, we got that every meteorite on loan from ASU. We had that all by itself in, the, uh, in our uh, current or older building. Um, and when I took it back after about a year, I said to the curator, you got any other ruins here that were, I mean, uh, meteorites that were found in ruins? And he goes, well, I got this, I think the bloody basin one was found in a, in a uh, ruin. So he took me to this thing, and it's about the size of a big potato. It's six inches by three by three, weighs about 11 pounds. And, and the story in the file, because he lets me look at all of their files, the file said it was, uh, it was brought in by this, this gentleman who was uh, out on a hunting trip with his eight-year-old son and a teenage son. And they were uh, over hunting by uh, right along the Birdie River, uh, about 15, 18 miles east of I-40, which wasn't, I don't know if I-40 was there then, but uh, of that road. Um, basically, the confluence of the Red Creek ruin that they thought was occupied 1150 to 1400. The problem was it's been pot-hunted to death. I mean, there's hardly any pottery left. There's hardly anything left over the years has been, been just ravaged. Um, but they kind of estimated it. They knew it burned down and they thought, well, it's roughly around 1400. Well, how do you prove that, you know, an, an eight year old found it, brought it back to the camp to dad and said, hey, look what I found, you know. And a couple years later, they took it down to ASU and they confirmed that it was, in fact, a meteorite. And, in fact, it was uh, from the Canyon Diablo meteorite crater. And it's 78 miles as the crow flies south of the crater. So we're getting farther away from the crater itself. So a few problems here. Well, the main problem was how, how do you believe an eight-year-old that he really found it in the ruin? How do you prove that it was in the ruin? Well, he's still alive. I called him up. He's in his late seventies, <laughs> and he remembers very well going in. He said, "Oh, I was bored in the camp. I, was, I decided to play. I, the fort was right there. I played cowboys and Indians, running around through the through the ruins there, and he found it and brought it back to the camp. So, okay, I guess you can believe him, but how do you really, really prove it? So. However, when we were looking close at it on the left, uh, that's a close up. That's what I have circled there, it, looks, it looked to me when I was there like charcoal. You kind of even see like the tree ring, it's the lines across it. And there were five or six of these at different, in different crevices. So we put it under that microscope that you see on the right. And uh, the curator said, Yeah, yeah, it looks like, looked like uh, charcoal of some sort. And I said, well, uh, you don't ask, you don't get. Any chance that I could get some of that? You know, I'll send it off for carbon dating. And I, he'd say, well, hell no. But he said, well, yeah, we don't care. It's not part of the metal. We don't care about the metal. <laughs> so anything that's attached to it, we don't care. So he gave me enough of it so that I could send it off for uh, carbon dating uh, down to Beta Analytics, which is down in, in uh, Miami. So I sent it down there, not knowing what I was going to find. And it came back with this chart. 
And as you see at the top, they estimated that the creek was inhabited from 1150 to 1400. And it comes back that uh, uh, one of the dates was 1365 to 1390, right at the time when they estimated that it might have burnt down. Uh, so the carbon actually did two things. Number one, it proved that it was in fact in the ruin because they had this uh, 600, 700 year old wood embedded in it. And secondly, it helped to solidify uh, to the to the Tonto National Forest archaeologists the date of the burn of its destruction by fire. So uh, the, the carbon dating of that in there was 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 pretty significant from for a couple of reasons. So ASU has been bugging me to write an article because he says, as far as we know, no one has ever done any carbon dating on anything attached to a meteorite before. And he says, so you've done it. You might find everybody running back to the meteorites to see if there's anything attached to it that they overlooked and might want to start doing some work. So we're putting that article together and we'll, we'll see if we can get it out. So it was it was kind of cool. So it, it was so we got the Camp Brady meteorite clearly within the ruin. We got the and now we got the Bloody Basin clearly within a ruin. So what else do we have? Well, the one you have out, uh, out there is uh, another one is Fossil Springs meteorite and it's it was found, it's 10 and a half pound, found in 1945 uh, by this guy whose job was to every day walk up and down the flume that provides the water to the power plant down there, the Pine Tiles water plant, uh, power plant, uh, to make sure there's no barriers or any obstruction of the water flow to the, to the plant. And so he found this uh, meteorite. Uh, he wasn't positive, he thought it was a rock, but it was pretty heavy, so he thought maybe it was an iron, uh, iron meteorite. And um, he called, um, Linger, who had at the time uh, this uh, museum up at Peter Crater, and um, he again bought it, and uh, they studied it and confirmed that it in fact was from Peter Crater, uh, Candy Devil Meteorite. And you can see a little map there uh, where he put a little red X on uh, Fossil Springs where he said he, he thinks he found it. So it was, it was down at the bottom. If, you're, if you know anything about Fossil Creek, the top of it is just lined with ruins on both sides. So did it was it in or it fell down? We'll never prove it. But it was it was very, very close to, to a ruin. Um, what you see there in the picture uh, is what you see outside. I was shocked frankly when I asked if I could get this that they actually let me have it. Because it's it's not only it's not that it's an iron meteorite or that it's from your crater. That's not a big deal. But you see the positive and negative little tape marks on it. H.H. Uh, Neninger, who, who again bought this, uh, he bought the temporary meteorite, um, and uh, uh, he didn't buy the education one, but he is considered the father of, of modern meteoritics, the study of meteorites. Um, he was the first to write a whole bunch of books, and he's published over 166 papers, uh, or 76 papers, four books, uh, passed away at 99, the day after Halley's Comet came through. He said, I, wanted to, I want to see Haley's Comet. He was 99 years old, Haley's Comet came, and he died the next day, which is kind of cool. Um, but, but he, among his, he's got like 140 something uh, discoveries that he's credited with. And one of which is it's iron, it's magnetic, and magnets have positive and negatively charged areas. So what he figured out was if you move a very sensitive compass across the surface of a meteorite, an iron meteorite, you're going to find positively charged and negatively charged areas within that same rock. Mm. Today, when you, uh, and he was the first to discover that. Today, they have a, a tool or a machine that can look at it, and the positive areas will turn up blue, and the negatives will turn up red. So you can see that online. That's they currently do, but he was the one that first discovered that. So I was shocked. So he says, well, you be careful with it. He says, just don't knock any of the tape off or I'll knock you off. So um, <laughs> so he, he just, but we've gotten a, a very good relationship over the years. So, uh, you know, I told him we'd be very, very careful with it. So, so this was just kind of cool. Another one that's nearby, it's from, and it's from the Meter Crater area. And the last one on display is this tiny little one. Um, this was found by uh, two um, uh, hikers. They were up in the uh, Man Mesa, uh, right along uh, Fossil Spring, Fossil Creek, and uh, on the Potato National Forest uh, near the town of Strawberry. So that's why they gave it the name uh, Strawberry Meteorite. There's actually another one called Strawberry Meteorite. So this is like Strawberry 2 uh, mm -hmm. in the catalog, international catalog. Um, but they, they, she, this woman found it. Uh, we went to her house to, uh, to look at it and, uh, and take pictures of it. 
and um, it's very small, two and a quarter by two by one, weighs less than half a pound. Um, and when you look at it there, you can see uh, right about in the middle, kind of a depressed little area. And, and the part at the top was kind of a little, again, a little curvature at the top. Um, right here, you have the little curvature here. If you put the web of your thumb there, and you put your thumb right here, it fits perfectly in your hand. And this edge is shiny. So it's possible this was used as a scraper tool, and they may never have recognized it as a, a piece of meteorite. Uh, but it was found within 100, 150 yards of a Pueblo right on the edge of Fossils Creek. So did they know it? Didn't they know it? We'll never know, but it was there. And so essentially she stole it from the Fresco National, from the Pueblo <laughs> National Forest, because it's, it's federal property. But they're not gonna come after her. So anyhow, so she was nice enough to loan it to us for, the, for this particular um, exhibit. But again, when they took it to, uh, and you'll see when you look at it, there's a little slice cut off of it, and that's what they cut off to determine that it was in fact uh, from from uh, any Diablo. So there's my finger, uh, and there you can see the sharp edge over there. So uh, again, we think it was uh, might have been used as a scraper, probably by the, the people there that were in that five room club right at the end of the, of the canyon edge. So here we have these these meteorites. We've got the the uh, Amberi one, the strawberry one, the fossil springs one, and the bloody basin. And you should see the different mileage to the uh, meteor crater. And in, in the international catalog of meteoritics, all four of these are, it says, manually transported by Native Americans. Because at the time when they do these, these uh, entries in the 60s, 70s, uh, 50s, they had no idea how could these have gotten this far away from the crater unless they were carried there. And so they were all, that's how the International Catalog reports them as, which has then become, an, from an archaeology perspective, they use the term manuports, and you transport it to their, their final destination. Um, so the big question to me was, uh, were these collected uh, at Meteor Crater? And were they traded from Meteor Crater? And so looking at, this is the 1895 Sociological Survey map of the first uh, study of Meteor Crater. You can see the, obviously the, the different topographical layers there. And if they show, I saw circled in red, they show four ruins that were clearly visible uh, to them in 1895 when they visited the site. And in the destruction descriptions, they said there were single room structures and a centralized fire pit. They were local, made of local stone, very crude masonry. Uh, there was a ventilation break in the walls. It appeared that they entered through the roof, and it was built uh, prior to 1300 based on the pottery church that were in the area there. So I, I mean, I'm looking at this, and, and uh, my wife and I went up to meet a creator. We pretended we were tourists, and we took the tour. And when we got to the end, they said, any questions? And I said, yeah, do you guys ever go down to the ruins? There's no ruins here. There's no ruins here at all. And I got really defensive about it. Now, whether he was told to not just to say there aren't any ruins or he really didn't know that there were ruins. But anyhow, he was very, and he was Navajo. And so he was kind of, you know, almost nasty. So I we went back, I went back to my car, I brought this map out and I said, uh, by the way, you said no ruins. Uh, there were four ruins in 1895. They knew nothing about it, he claimed. And there was another guy there and she again didn't know anything about it. But he said, let's ask, I forget his name, Fred or Joe or whatever. It's been around there for like forever. And sure enough, he knew there were ruins there, but he, they were told not to say anything. So again, fortunately, I got a little friendly with the staff there, professional staff. And I said, can I get a permit to go look at those ruins? I'd like to see if there was any evidence that they were collecting fragments. There should be, if they were collecting fragments for trade, there should be a little pile of them somewhere you know, near these ruins. And so he said, well, as long as you're a company. So, they had a retiree who said, yeah, I'd love to go back there. So uh, we went out there and looked at them all. Uh, the three on the bottom, uh, the two close together, were destroyed by a, a later uh, silica mine. Uh, that they were, uh, they were uh, mining silica there. Uh, and you've probably heard of Comet Cleanser. Uh, the old play Comet Cleanser, Comet Cleanser was uh, named because it used silica, a race of silica from Peter Crater. And so they named it Comet. Uh, but they found after a couple of years, it was so abrasive, it was ripping the hell out of everything they used it on. So they stopped using the silica there and went to something else, but they kept the name Comet uh, Cleanser. 
because it came from Media Crater. So those two, we, we pretty much show that it was destroyed. The, the, the lot one down below, it was basically just all, it was just an outline of rock. Um, and there was nothing really there since it was so close to the mines and everything. We figured, oh, it was probably got 500 anyway, so we couldn't tell anything. But when it got lined up in, in, in purple, it was still intact. And we found that and went, went over there. And this is what it looks like. It's pretty weird. Um, this is big outcropping here. And you can see this little recessed area. It was like a bed space in here. And here's the rock that outlined the room. It went around like that. And so um, what was interesting is, again, we didn't find anything around it. No, no pottery bits, no, uh, uh, no meteorite fragments at all there. But when you went around the back side, where's my finger? Um, oh, come on. There we go. Um, there. When you go around the back side around here, it's like a stairwell to the top. And you can get all the way to the top here very comfortably with a little stairway. So it looked to us more like a hunting blind because it's way up at the rim. You can see the rim right there, and the, and the rim is way up high. It's like six, 700 feet above the flat land. And so we think this might have not been really a dwelling, but more of a, a temporary hunting place and a hunting blind. When you're up there, you can see for miles and miles. So if there's a herd of antelope or something out there, you're going to see it like them in two seconds. So we kind of suggest that's what it is. The artifacts you see there found at sites in earlier studies, uh, it had productive points, it had different pottery bits, it had Christian whiteware um, in the early studies. So when they were first going out there in 1895, that's when they found this pottery bit. Over time, it all just been ripped apart or, or taken away. So there was nothing left for me to find. But nothing screened uh, trading post. So, so what's, what's the next solution? If it wasn't traded, it was a chance collected by chance and so doing a little more digging around, uh, not only were the four that we have on display here found in or near ruins, but the International Catalog lists six additional meteorites that say manually transported by Native Americans. And when you look at those particular sites, there's nothing around it. There's no Native American ruin or nothing near it. So if, if, it, if the top four was manually transported um, and they're near ruins, well, you could say, well, maybe, but these other six, it didn't make any sense. Uh, they weren't near any kind of dwellings at all. And so we have a little conundrum here. If they were chance collected, what are these doing down here? If they weren't mainly transported, in fact, uh, like the catalog suggests. So here we have all 10. So I got the four that we have on display, plus all the rest of them. And you can see way down in the lower left, there's uh, Edinburgh, and then you got Wickenburg, Fair Oaks, Ash Fork, uh, and then our four. And then way north of it, you got Ganado and the Hoke. Uh, meteorites, all that came from meteor crater, the crater right in the center there. So here we have this, this pattern of 10 different meteorites. So um, recent studies done basically just in the last three years, four years, uh, they confirmed through computer modeling that rather than just one big large mass, like a big ball of iron, uh, the candy double meteorite was referred to as a heavily fragmented swarm. So as this big rock, this big asteroid was coming through the atmosphere for millions, billions of years, it would get hit by other pieces. And its momentum alone kept all the fragments together. So it continued in this path um, as, as a swarm of smaller pieces. And they also figured out that at least 50% of the main impactor part was rejected ejected over nine square miles around the crater. So the area around the crater was just covered with pieces. Uh, they said at least 50% of, of, its, of its mass. Um, if you've been down there, you, not too far away is a railroad track. And there's records where the railroad would stop and they would send workers out and they would collect these iron fragments and take them back and melt them to turn them into uh, uh, rails for the trains. And so you might be, you know, the trains out of Flagstaff may actually be on your crater iron uh, as this goes along there. Um, and then it says smaller fragments can separate from the swarm and land on the plains tens of kilometers away from the crater as individual meteorites. Because as it enters the atmosphere, it, it hits and it's an atmosphere. And suddenly this got some force against it. And let's see smaller pieces towards the end start to fall off first. Uh, and then when they studied it, the highest concentration of impact of the fragments occurred to the Northeast, suggesting that the direction was from the Southwest. So if we look at these meteorites that we saw earlier again, and we track it along the Southwest pattern, 
that happens. All of these are falling off from the meteor as it enters the atmosphere along what they call the equatorial path of the, of the meteorite. And it's not unusual that when a meteorite hits the, its final destination, it also throws pieces off to the, to the north. And so the Hulk and Granada were probably thrown off to the north. Now that line is just perfect in southwest. It could have been you know, a couple of degrees either way that would really make a difference so where well, it was, but you get the sense, at least from this, that coming from the southwest, uh, all of these are along that, that particular path. So the conclusion that, that I reached is the Cambrian meteorite was buried in a ceremonial style similar to Winona and Pacome. The bloody basin meteorite, meteorite carbon dated, established that it was in the ruin at the time of, of the destruction by fire. It provided the date range of the ruin's destruction. This intended use cannot be determined. I mean, it could have been a rock among the wall, rock walls and not even recognize that a meteorite. There's just no way to know whether it was in a revered spot or, or what. Uh, the Fossil Springs meteorite, again, can't be confirmed as being in a dwelling uh, or its use. And the strawberry most likely was used for utilitarian purposes, a script or a knife, and not ceremonial. So that's the best we can come up with these particular four meteorites. So, but all 10 of them, when you look at it as a group, uh, they were detachments from the main mass during the atmospheric passage. Uh, the aerodynamic deflection allowed fragments to enter new trajectories that allowed them to slow down uh, and actually impact the region outside of the main crater. Uh, the material removed from the main mass would be expected to have originated along what you call the equatorial band. So if the meteorite is going in a southwest pattern, all the pieces that were falling off would expect to be in that same southwest equatorial Hand as it motions through the atmosphere. And so the four meteorites found in or near the ruins were most likely a result of chance collecting rather than being manually transported from the crater. So we've put that together in an article. ASU has reviewed it. ASU says, go for it. So we're going to be looking for a publication place that's on this particular meteorite. And basically, it's, he says, well, you're going to raise some eyebrows because you're questioning this international catalog of meteoritics that says it was uh, mainly transported, and you're saying, nah, <laughs> for any of those. So, uh, but he says it's important you know, to, uh, to put that out, and he's particularly interested in, that, in the carbon dating material of one meteorite, since he says it's never been done. He's never found an article that, that anybody did any kind of or testing of material attached to a meteorite before. So, so it was, it's was been a fun, fun project, and we're really, really lucky that they have loaned us uh, these and, and, uh, and Debbie loaning us the small strawberry one. Uh, we've been working also with Meteor Crater, and they are producing, he says, a 10 foot uh, big mural of Meteor Crater from the air that will go against that big black wall or gray wall as you walk in. So we'll have this humongous aerial view of the crater uh, as you right walk into that room there. So um, he was all excited. So I, I, he hasn't given me a date, so I'm going to start plugging him tomorrow. So, uh, so, so that, oh, and then interestingly too, we've been open a couple of weekends and people would ask, well, you know, these are iron meteorites. Aren't there other types? Well, yeah, there are other types. There's uh, a, what's called a stony meteorite, which iron meteorites about 95% iron, nickel, and other materials like that. Stony meteorites are almost all silicate materials. They're basically like river rocks, they, and they look like river rocks because as they're coming through the atmosphere, they hit, hit the earth, and they start to tumble, like rocks in a tumbler. And so by the time it lands on the earth, it's kind of smooth, and it looks kind of like, like a river cobble, basically. So 95% of the meteorites that are found in collections are iron meteorites because they react to magnets. They're easier to see. They're a little different. The stony meteorites are, are basically the bulk of what hits the earth because they look so much like an earth rock, but we nobody not recognizes them. So there's probably millions of them laying around that nobody has, has recognized. And the only way you can tell a stony meteorite is you have to slice it and you have to see its internal composition. It's got little white dots in it. You'll see it's called chondrites, and it's but that's how that's how you tell the difference. And then there's a, there's a stony iron meteorite, which is about 50-50 stone and iron. So they sometimes, depending on the percentage, might react to magnets, they might not react. So, um, so since that was asked a lot, uh, I called went back down to ASU and I said, hey, um, we got the Cottonwood meteorite. It was found actually closer to Clarkdale than Cottonwood, but Cottonwood was bigger than I. So they named it Cottonwood meteorite, and it's a stony meteorite. And they sliced it. And it was actually on display at the Sedona Meteorite Museum for a number of years, and then the miniature uh, sold it to ASU. So I said, 
just so I can show them what a stony meteorite looks like. Can I get the stony meteorite for display? So we're actually going down Thursday and picking that one up. And we'll add that to the collection. So we get a little picture of what are meteorites and, and how are they working. So, so that's the presentation. Uh, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Before we break up, I did want to mention um, we are doing a uh, Hopi Happy Holiday. Um, we are uh, talk, we've talked to the Hopi, and they would like for Christmas to get some non-perishable foods. There's a flyer out there, basically canned foods, jarred foods, that kind of thing. Uh, new blankets, and if uh, we just want to make a cash contribution that we can go and buy the stuff and bring it up there, uh, we can do that on the website. So we're, we're going to be doing this through the 18th. It'll be on the website. We'll put out an email to the members in the next uh, day or so. Uh, so we just like we did last year, we're doing a little help the Hopi uh, at the holiday times. Okay. Sure. Questions. They wouldn't allow it. Yeah, no, they wouldn't allow it. Uh, in fact, um, uh, because we found this in, in uh, the uh, uh, down Heathrow one over here in Camp Verde, and we had the one in, in the Bloody Basin one, and we got the one that's near Fossil Creek, I said to the Forest Service, I go to some ruins and bring a metal detector out to see if I can find if there are any more meteorite fragments out there. And they said, hell no, because if you find it picking, you'll want to start taking something apart. You want to take, move rocks, you want to move the ruin, and we don't want you to do that. And so they, they don't want any metal, tech, metal detectors within in the ruins. So uh, the crater wouldn't allow me and, and the forest won't allow me either. So. Yeah, over here. Where you have that patterns and silver patterns. Oh, 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 yeah, I should have put the slide on that in there. Um, so people ask, you know, how do, how do we know that these four are actually from the same meteorite, the Kenny Devlin meteorite? And if there's every meteorite has a, a very specific mineralogical content. So a certain percentage of iron, of nickel, of chromium, of, of silica, different, different things. And so it's almost like a little of DNA, if you will, of it. And so if you find other meteorites and you do a mineralogical analysis of it and it comes up with exactly the same percentages and mixes of, of those minerals, it's going to be the, from the same meteorite. The only other way to do it is to slice it. And, and I get people coming in here with a book of, bunch of iron. Now, I think this is a meteorite. Well, you'd have to let me have it and take it down to ASU and have to slit it open. Oh, no, you can't touch my meteorite. So I said, well, then go away. But, um, they, they basically find it in Jerome area where there's, there's iron you know, all over the place over the iron slag. So if you slice it, like the one sample we have in there, um, there's what's called a, a Wittenstein pattern. I'm going to probably mispronounce that. But this was a professor, Austrian professor, that discovered that um, as a meteorite or asteroid is, is going through the, the universe, it basically starts off as a big ball of molten metal. And it's shooting through the, through the atmosphere. And it takes, according to the paper that I read, 100,000 years for that metal to cool one degree. And as it cools, it's creating these crystalline patterns within it. And it becomes like a fingerprint. So if you slice open every one of those, which they did, slice open every one of those four meteorites out there, they have this crystalline pattern identical. They each have exactly the same crystalline pattern uh, in all of them. Um, the picture of the, of, in that it's gotten a board above the slice. The slice is from the Toluca uh, meteorite in the Toluca Valley in, in Mexico. Um, I asked him if I could get the Camp Verde meteorite slice that he had. They gave it, sold it to some other museum. So he said, I'll give you this other one so that at least you can see live what these patterns look like. So it's the Toluca one. But the picture up above is actually a picture of the slice of the Candy Diablo that's on the, if you go to the British Museum of Natural History, and you type in meteorites, that's what will pop up. Because they bought a third of Dr. Ninninger's collection when he decided to start selling. And they have a lot of fragments of, of the Canyon Tablet meteorite. So it's either the mineralogical content or the slicing and the pattern, crystal patterns that you see within it, it identifies it as a coming from the same type of meteorite. Are, are all of the meteorites extraterrestrial or can some of them be volcanic action? Well, there's, there's iron material within the earth, right. and it's mostly called iron oxide because it has, it's been living in an, an oxygen environment for many millions of years. Then the, the native iron that comes through the atmosphere, it's not, there's no oxygen anywhere. 
So it has not absorbed any oxygen. So it's, it's basically what they call native or natural iron as opposed to iron oxide found within the earth. So you can have iron produced from within the earth and there is iron from within the earth and it can come up from volcanoes. But the way you tell the difference is the degree of iron. And usually there's no nickel in the American or in the world uh, Earth's uh, iron that comes out. There's very almost no nickel. And that's one of the big determining factors. I don't know if this makes any sense at all, but it seems to me if they wanted to get some central heat in their little dwelling and they had a meteorite, they could heat it, you know, with fire, and then it would, it would, uh, yeah. You know? and, and I mean, that's a possibility. I mean, you can do that though with uh, just regular rock. I mean, uh, we have in, in our collection, we'll, pop, we'll put them out on display when we finish some of these. We have a whole series of these uh, stone balls. And we, uh, uh, and, and nobody really knows. If there's smaller ones, it might have been using a slingshot or something like that. Or even smaller ones might have been using a game. But some of these are, are like the size of, uh, uh, like the size of a golf ball. And a lot of them. And so we had a, a group of Yavapai women in here one time, and, and they were looking at it. And, oh, they were making noise. And, and so what, what's so interesting, and they were talking about the balls that were there. And they said, uh, they, they, when they would make stew, they would take these stone balls, put them in the fire, heat them up. And then when they would serve the stew, they would put a ball in the vessel with the stew to keep the stew warm. And so, yeah, so I mean, they could have taken them and put them in their bed. They could have, you know, who knows what. But so the the idea of of heating stone is not foreign. So they could have, yeah, yeah. yeah. And if they core it down in the media crater, um, would they find more meteorites? Well, that's that's where uh, Berenger bought it. But the, the idea is, okay, here, this is clearly it was one of the first, like 1901 or so, that was convinced that it was uh, created by a meteor. Uh, U.S. Geological Survey in 1895 thought it was a result of some underground volcanic activity, or it might have been an old lake bed. Okay? And it wasn't until 1904, 1905 that U.S. Geological Survey agreed that it was from a meteorite. Well, Berenger, around 1901 or two, was convinced it was. And so he bought it all up. And he was convinced, if I dig down in the middle, I'll find this humongous piece of iron, and, I, and I'll make a fortune on it. Yeah. And, he, and if you go to the crater now and you look down to the bottom, you'll see remnants of his, his mining operation, the drilling operation. And, and he basically went bankrupt three times uh, because he, he wasn't finding anything. He goes, yeah, exactly. I mean, he'd find more investors. He was a, he was a good, you know, he, wrote, he wrote scientific articles. It was published in different journals. So, you know, oh, this guy must know what he's talking about. And so he was able to constantly raise money. And then and it just, at one point, he just, they said, that's it. There, there's nothing in there. And so what, what they finally figured out is there was, people look at this and they say, oh, it, it hit in the middle and it blew all this stuff out. No. What they finally figured out is as it was entering the atmosphere, when it got to a certain level above the earth, it, 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 uh, it created a concussion explosion in the atmosphere. And the concussion is what threw the earth out like that. That's why there's no big pieces in the middle. And at that concussion, that's when it threw out stuff over. When you look at it, like the one picture, probably see if I can find this one quickly, the USGS one. Uh, actually, there's a huge debris field of meteorite fragments up here. And so, um, and so that's why they thought it, it came from the Southwest and exploded here in debris field here and then a chat those you know Hoke and, and uh, Granado farther north. Um, so it, there was nothing in the middle. You know they didn't find anything in the middle because it was strong, thrown out all over the place. They find little fragments, but then again I said as I said the railroads would go by and pick them up off the ground and, and melt them down. But um, no he never found anything in the middle. He, like I said he went paper three times. But then he kept it uh, and then his miniature because uh, he was really into the meteorites, he kept going out there and collecting stuff. And, and I've, I've actually seen letters from uh, Berenger to Berenger uh, saying, get the hell off my property, stop collecting my stuff. You know, because he was getting really pissed off because he's writing articles about it and writes a book about it, and they're not getting any revenue from any of the stuff that he's writing about. And, and so he became a persona non grata you know, on, in, in the meteor crater area. So interesting little there's there was also a professor from university of new mexico who thought he was the father of meteoritics and so they were back and forth back and forth and critical of each other so it's an interesting little little 
files of, of letters uh, down at ASU. What happened to the bulk of it? The bulk of it just it, it exploded, and the bulk of it just vaporized. Uh, some of it vaporized or turned into dust. You know, okay. like when, when I when I'm, I give these talks to archaeology clubs a lot, and and I say, well, you realize you see all these shooting stars that come in here, and they kind of like in the, you know in the, in the air, and they don't always hit the ground. But when they in the air, you know, that, that it's matter. It doesn't bend. It just turns into dust. And it falls on the earth, and they estimate about a hundred thousand tons of meteoritic dust falls on the earth every year. A lot of it on the water, you know, in forests or whatever. But I tell these guys, if you're out in the forest out here hiking and you got a pole, a little bag at the bottom of your pole, take it to the bottom of your pole, and by the time you get back, I'll bet you any money there'll be little fragments of here attached to it. It's probably meteoritic dust attached to it. And and I've got people who come back to me later. I've got these test tube. It's full of these little. There's only a fragment that I that I collected in my hiking um, because it's everywhere. So it did, it did vaporize some of it, uh, some of the bigger pieces, 50% of it, as it said, uh, was ejected over a nine mile area around it. Uh, another certain percentage, high percentage ended up on the, on the north uh, east end of it. Um, and so and then some of it was vaporized. So yeah, it's an interesting story about you know, this guy that had all this money and raised all this money that, well, after something that just wasn't there. No. Yeah. Yeah. So, but his family still owns it. It's the Barringer Foundation uh, that I'm talking to, and uh, they still own it. And uh, you know, they, they, they got a lot of money when the astronauts wanted to do their testing down there. Um, and so it gets a lot of publicity from that as well. The fee to go there now is something like $35, $40 to get in there. Pretty, pretty pricey. Yeah. Well, that guy is failed attempts to mine iron out of there that led to this theory that it wasn't a solid impact that made these craters that it was a concussion. Uh, it, it, it's partly, partly that helped to confirm the theory, but they've done all kind of computer modeling of the fragments that are all over the place uh, to show that it had to be uh, a, a swarm rather than a solid piece. So if they had found just humongous, you know, 50,000 ton piece, they would say, well, that was the core of it, and everything else fell on any big pieces like that. So the biggest piece that they have, like at ASU, is maybe half the size of one of those tables outside. It's they're not that they're not that big. So maybe like four by four by two or something like that. It's the biggest piece that I've ever seen that they have. So uh, just it just broke up. And swarm meteorites are not unusual. So as I was studying this, when they, they came up with, well, we think this was a swarm, fragmented swarm meteorite. Out. What the hell is that? And so I started looking more and more, and there's there's quite a few around the world that they have determined it was a swarm meteorite. Yeah. So, I guess probably something that hasn't been discovered yet around here, right? Uh, fragments? Fragments? Oh, yeah. The, if you follow this southwest pattern, you're going to probably find more. Uh, but again, remember, this this was about 50,000 years ago, yeah. and it's iron. And so it's going to rust. It's going to start to degrade. So if it hit, 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 hit by the rain and all kind of stuff. So you might not be able to see it as, as much. But hey, it's in the fossils, but those are pretty good chunks of, of iron. Yeah. So there might still be some more out there. No question about it. Yeah, yeah. Just don't do it on a forest because that'll jump all over you. So yeah. You can... <laughs> so any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks for coming out. Thank you. Thank you that are watching out there. Have a good night.